Hello everyone and welcome to a devlog of my savior village by building a defense turn-based strategy game. I hope you enjoy the video. In the last devlog I swapped out a garbage version of my landscape renderer for one that is minimalistic. Well, minimalistic for development purposes and not from an art perspective. The next task was to finally start work on gameplay almost nine months after I first started work on the project. In a game centered around proper military tactics, starting work on gameplay wasn't just a matter of opening up the code editor and typing away. Let me try and explain that. Let's say there is a 2D grid, which is nothing but a graph of nodes connected to each other. An enemy unit is placed in one cell and its target in another cell. Reaching the target is a simple matter of applying graph traversal algorithm. Now let's add some obstacles that you can control and the enemy unit cannot pass through. The problem pretty much remains the same, except that the underlying node graph gets modified, after which the same graph traversal algorithm can be applied. Next, we'll make the obstacles have costs for passing through instead of being impossible. This changes the solution to a weighted graph traversal algorithm. Now we'll add multiple targets, giving it shades of the traveling salesman problem, where you need to optimize the distance traveled as well. Let's add a defender unit that you, the player, will control, and whose job is to prevent the enemy from reaching any or all targets. This adds the first strategic element to the AI. The defender unit is no longer just a node in the graph which has a cost. It is also a node that will move with every turn. Let's add three defender units. Let's also give the enemy three units. Now that we are at it, we'll make some of the obstacles dynamic. Oh, and you know what? Initially, the AI is not aware of where the targets, defenders and obstacles are in the beginning. It needs to explore and find out. So let's level the playing field by giving the enemy 10 units instead of three. The enemy doesn't need to use all unit at once. It can select a few whose purpose is to scout first and based on the information the scouts get, the enemy can allocate more units for varying missions. And yes, the missions can be varied. Maybe the scouts found out that there are three bridges to cross the river, and there is a target near the third bridge. The AI then guesses that you would have stationed most of the defenders near the third bridge, so it creates two teams, one for diversion and the second to ambush from the other side. I hope you can see the non-trivial problem over here. The complexity is arising not just out of optimal graph traversal with multiple factors, but out of wanting to replicate the subjectivity of human decision making. It is very important that the AI does a fair job of intelligent tactics, otherwise it would be too predictable too soon and you would lose interest. And I feel losing interest is not just about being able to easily beat the AI, because on easier levels you will be able to do that, but more because the AI feels very computerized and mechanical. Sorry I don't think I used the correct terms there to express my thoughts, but I hope you get the emotion. All the explanation above was to get to the point that gameplay for such a game is a lot more on the paper first and then on the code editor. It is not just about going in and implementing a weighted graph traversal algorithm. A lot of reading up on military tactics, writing notes, experimenting with decision making frameworks is needed before programming anything. This is where two challenges arise. First, to find the line between over-designing a system and designing just enough. I have accepted the fact that I will overshoot in some direction frequently and I just have to be okay with it and try to be better as I go. Second challenge is to be okay with not programming for a few days. As a programmer, all I want to do is open up the editor, type away an algorithm and bask in the glory of dopamine after seeing favorable results on screen. Although spending days reading and researching is good too. So I decided to have the best of both worlds by dividing my day into programming tasks and gameplay design research. My immediate need was to display debug information on the screen since it was annoying to sift through console messages. Also being a turn-based strategy game, there shall be heavy use of UI. So I thought why not start in that direction. First step, display text on the screen. For that I need a font. A common approach with fonts is to get a bitmap or texture of each glyph in a particular size. There are three ways to get the bitmaps. First, parse the font file yourself. Second, use a library that parses it for you. Third, use the operating system's API. 
I'm not using external libraries in the project, but for passing the font bitmaps, it is fine to use one because it is not going to be a part of the executable. I will pre-process the font files using a library and then store the glyphs in the asset file. So the library will not ship with the game. In games, you don't need to support multiple font sizes or even font types. So baking them in the asset file is fine. I chose the STB library because usually STB libraries are very sturdy and also very easy to use as opposed to using Windows API, which you know you can spend a lot of time to just get some very basic information. It is literally just two lines of code to extract the glyph from the STB library. I started out by doing the simplest possible thing, extracted glyphs from a range of ASCII codes. Well, not exactly ASCII since the library supports Unicode code points. I then sent all the glyphs in an array to the GPU. Which glyph was to be drawn was provided by the index field. You can also combine them all into a single texture. First task was to draw a single character. Then to draw two characters spaced out by an arbitrary amount. But it showed some artifacts. This is where I got stuck with this bug for almost two days. My first guess was there is something wrong with texture coordinates, but they seemed fine. The bug also only showed up when the characters were different. This led me to trying out different variables in the shader code instead of an array, and it worked. So there was some problem with using unbounded arrays. I then stumbled upon this article that fortunately was written for the exact same bug. So if the resource index is going to change in a single draw call, apply non-uniform resource index. I was using instancing, so I was using multiple indices in a single draw call. When I drew the same character twice, the index did not change and hence no artifacts. Before I proceeded with rendering a line with proper spacing, I needed alpha blending, which was a pretty simple thing to do. On to rendering lines of text. There are a few metrics provided by every font file that tell you how to space characters and lines in a particular font. Some of those metrics are baseline, this is the vertical position at which all characters are drawn in a line. Current point, this is the horizontal position the next character is drawn. Origin of each character. Ascent is the height above the baseline the character extends. Similarly, descent is the extent downwards. Left side bearing is the extent to which the character extends to the left. Right side bearing is the corresponding value for the right side. Advance width is the amount to advance horizontally for the next character. I'm not too sure about this one though. Kerning is very important. The spacing between two characters depends on which characters they are. A and B will have different spacing to I and J. This relative spacing is stored in a kerning table. Using these, we can easily render a line or even multiple lines. It is just about computing the current point and baseline using the metrics above for the font and its characters. This is by no means a complete method. I'm very new to implementing fonts and have almost no knowledge of the nuances of typography. But during my testing, it seemed to be working fine. Talking about testing fonts, I highly recommend using a pixel magnification tool. I use color cop and it really helps me debug and test out the spacing and color. If I want a one pixel spacing on the left side, it is hard to test without magnification. Once I was able to render multiple lines, all I needed was to be able to convert number values to a string of characters and then display them. I have a debug buffer onto which I push debug info. For example, to display how many cycles a particular piece of code is consuming, I push the name of the module, then push the 64-bit integer value, and if I want to go to the next line, I simply add the new line operator. It works differently than something like a printf, which has tokens to insert multiple values, so my method is not very good looking, but it works for something like debug information. And for the little time I spent on it, I'm quite satisfied. So that is it. It turned out to be a longer devlog as compared to any I have posted yet, but I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you hopefully very soon. Thank you for watching.